Okay, any questions from the last time? Uh, last time, where did we arrive? Yeah, we arrived at the chap up to chapter. You got the notes, right? Yeah. Good. So, okay, so up to chapter 3, we finished chapter 3, right? The one SO, SO2, SO1, comma 1, etc. we discussed. Okay. Any questions on that? It's all clear, right? Okay. So now... Yeah. I think that you showed that SO13 was... SO? Uh, SO? 13 uh, in the first group was uh, non-compact, right? It's so one comma one. Yeah. Ah, okay. That is. How do you do the? How how do you genetically prove that something is compact or not compact? I would. Uh, well, I mean, I think yeah. Okay. Uh, easiest way to think about it is that if a space is some finite space, right. finite, I mean, uh, parameters do not go to infinity. Yes. You know, uh, that is the. Of course, there is a way to because we have not introduced the notion of distance. Okay. You know. Uh, but you can actually introduce the notion of distance, uh, length, you know? and with respect to that, you can make it more precise. So uh, the, the statement I made is not very precise, mm -hmm. uh, because I mean what I said was simply because uh, you have in one case you have cos theta, I mean the trigonometric function. Yes. You have cos theta and sine theta, right? In the case of SO2, right. Whereas in the case of SO1, comma one, we had hyperbolic cos, uh, say lambda and sine hyperbolic lambda. And of course, this they the, the this go from all the way from zero to infinity, right? Yeah. So, and whereas these are just uh, the, the are are bounded. Bounded. yeah bounded. But uh, I mean, this of course is. Uh, uh, not very precise because I mean you can make some coordinate transformations and no. what looks finite in some uh, coordinate system, yes. you know, it becomes infinite range, right, in the another coordinate system. So to be to define it more properly, one should define a notion of distance. Okay. Okay. Uh, which uh, maybe later on we will discuss, uh, perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure we'll arrive at that point. But uh, you can introduce a notion of distance, and with respect to that, you see that that uh, you can go all the way infinitely far away. No. From one point to another point, like the invariant interval in the Minkowski case. M Minkowski, yeah, but that not just Minkowski. I mean, even uh, mm -hmm. a three-dimensional Euclidean space, okay. Okay. Yeah, or yes. even a real line, line is non-compact, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, just a real line is uh, non-compact. So compactness is not to do with the nothing to do with the signature of the metric. Uh -huh. No, uh, even a Euclidean signature, yeah, the space can be non-compact. Uh -huh. So take a circle or I take a real line. No, mm -hmm. uh, circle is compact, uh, whereas. Yeah, yeah. But as I said, I mean to to proper more correctly define it, we need to know, define a notion of distance. No? I see. Then with respect to that notion, mm -hmm. then you see that uh, in your space there are points infinitely far away, no? okay. and that kind of yeah. Okay. But I mean, for all practical purposes, you can just see the range of parameters. No? Okay. If the range of parameters is unbounded. Then uh, it's basically no, broken. Yeah. If uh, we have two groups acting in the same way on the vector space, are they necessarily as one? If the two groups act on or on the same space, yeah, are they in the same? Are they necessarily as one? No, no. I mean, in fact, uh, um, in fact, that's one of the things I'll be talking about now. Uh, take an example. I mean, let's say I have a two-dimensional space, x and y. Right. And now here there are several uh, symmetries, uh, several groups are acting here, okay, which are not isomorphic. So, for example, uh, you can take a translational group, translational group. Uh, so, which is simply taking any point x y. I mean, a, a coordinate, a arbitrary point will be x y, right? The coordinates. So, x y goes to say x plus a y plus b, where a and b are some numbers. No, some real numbers. So this this will generate this other translational group. This is just this nothing else. I mean, you have already seen that, right? Uh, not in two dimension, but you already we saw that x going to x plus a 
that was a one dimensional translation group uh, group uh, group is the, the elements of the group are labeled by a okay and this a is belongs to real numbers so the whole real line so that was a translation group now what we have what i'm considering is a two dimensional space this was one dimensional space x x was just one coordinate but now i go to two dimensional space then i can independently translate along the x direction or along the y direction right or, or more generally along both directions together mm -hmm. yeah? so so this is basically a two copies of that i mean this group this group is labeled by the elements are labeled by a and b because i'm translating by a and translating by b along the two different axes so this group is like two copies of r and actually uh, you usually you write it as r times r okay i mean this is a notation we will uh, see later but uh, the point is okay so this is a group which is which is two copies of r right but there is also another group which is acting on it for example a rotation group i can rotate the points right so you have so2 which is nothing else but so2 group which is uh, simply what it does it takes a vector xy to uh, a rotation rotation by some theta i mean i don't know this r this r is not the same as that r that's a real this is the rotation rotation maybe i should write it explicitly rotation by theta uh, of the x and y which is as you saw it is simply cosine theta minus sin theta uh, sin theta cosine theta acting on x and y yeah now this is a another group this is a, a so2 group this this is a so2 group which is acting on the same space on the xy space right so here you have an example where the there is a translational group and the rotation group and the, these two groups are not isomorphic no what if they if they are the same way? Ah, oh, of course. Then it will be a sum of it. No, I, I thought what you are saying is that on the space oh, okay. there are various groups are acting, uh, but they need not be a sum of it. But if the two groups are acting exactly in the same way, then of course, yeah. yeah. Um, any other question? Uh, please uh, ask a lot of questions. I mean, that's the main point. All right. So then, uh, let's uh, see, see the, with this example. Um, uh, okay. So, so the next concept. Uh, so here we talked about the five, uh, group, right? But uh, at these groups, uh, these groups are different from the finite groups that we talked about, right? Uh, like Z n groups and so on and so forth. These groups are parameterized by uh, some continuous parameter, right? like a and b could be arbitrary real numbers right similarly theta could be an arbitrary uh, real number between 0 and 2 pi right so these are continuously you can change no? so therefore uh, then um, and of course in all of these groups there is an identity element of course by definition any group must have an identity element in this case the identity element is simply take theta equal to 0 if you take theta equal to 0 these guys become 0 0 and that becomes 1 1 right which is the identity element which means you are not doing any rotation zero zero rotation right so and here again uh, if i uh, this a is continuous parameter if i take a equal to 0 and b equal to 0 that is you are doing nothing you this that's an identity element of the group right so uh, so you can always talk about you can think about the following thing what i will i consider is infinitesimal infinitesimal transformations infinitesimal transformations i mean sometimes i do not write the full words because uh, it takes time but i hope the meaning is clear okay so infinitesimal transformations uh, which means uh, so we are we want to look at the elements of the group so what this means it means that we are looking at elements of the group which are very close to identity which are very close to identity 
identity element. Of course, this makes no sense for the finite group, right? This makes sense only if you have a continuous parameters, right? Uh, so this is really valid only for continuous groups. So I, I just don't study this infinitesimal part. Of course, once you are, and, and the, the, the point is that we'll actually, what, what we'll be doing is that in this entire course, we'll be actually focusing on this, right? Because if you know about the infinitesimal, how the infinitesimal uh, transformations act, then of course you can get any finite transformation by repeatedly applying this infinitesimal transformations, mm -hmm. no? So a huge amount of structure uh, of the group is uh, we can learn by just studying the infinitesimal transformations and studying the structure of the infinitesimal transformations. Right? Not uh, everything, of course. Uh, there are some things like global structures of the group that will not be visible from here. Hmm? But many I important properties you can understand from this infinitesimal, the study of infinitesimal transformation. So, what does it mean? So, so let's... Uh, uh, So, more generally, let's say I have some, uh, so what does it mean? It, it means that I look at, so G is an element of the group, okay? And now suppose that it's a continuous group, so there will be several parameters. Uh, say this, this group is some, some dimensional group, n-dimensional group, okay? What do I mean by n-dimensional group? It means to specify the group G, I need to specify uh, these parameters, I don't know, let's just call it alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n. Huh? A, a, an element of the group is uh, uh, parameterized by certain number of parameters. Huh? That number of parameters, of course, defined is a dimension of the group. Okay? This n here is a dimension of the group. Example, uh, for this rotation group, you see, the gen uh, most general rotation group acting on the two-dimensional space is parameterized by just one parameter, theta, right? So the dimension of this group is one. Or if you take a translational group, say in two dimensions, if I take sim uh, just one dimensional translational group, it is parameterized by one continuous parameter A. So its dimension is also one. Right? It, but in, in the two-dimensional case, I have two parameters here. So this R, which is R cross R, that is, is dimension 2, right? So the number of parameters which are required to specify a general group, group element, a generic group element hmm, in that particular group is known as a dimension of the, is called the dimension of the group. Okay. So, so let's say I consider an n-dimensional group. So I have a, a, an arbitrary element of this group G will be parameterized by this n parameters. Okay. Remember, so from now on, I'm only going to be discussing continuous groups, not finite groups. Right? So these are all the continuous parameters. So now, in, and let's suppose I choose my parameters in such a way that all the alpha i equal to zero, when I choose alpha i equal to zero, that corresponds to, that corresponds to, this corresponds to, So G of 0, 0, 0 equal to the identity element. I think I was using the term E. Yeah? Okay. So, okay, so I choose the parameter in such a way that when all these parameters are 0, 0, 0, 0, then that is the identity element. Okay. And now, I, I want in, uh, what we are trying to study here is uh, group elements which are very close to the identity. But that I can think of, I can start from this general element, set alphas or alpha, all the alphas equal to zero, and then just change the alpha a little bit. No? Uh, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe I should not do this n of them, just take one of them. So let's just take an uh, example here. So here the rotation group element. So let me just call it g of theta. So this is SO2. Okay. So g of theta, uh, as we saw, is nothing else but cosine theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. And indeed it's clear that we have chosen the parameter in such a way that g of 0 
is equal to the identity. Right? But now what I want to do is I want to study this G of thetas, where those elements which are very close to the identity. Right? Which is nothing else but doing a Taylor expansion. Right? Taylor series expansion. Right? So I can take G theta and if so if theta is small, if theta is small, meaning close to zero, very close to zero, that means it is close to the identity. Okay. Then I can make a Taylor expansion. So it will be g of zero plus theta uh, times uh, dg by d theta at theta equal to zero plus uh, higher order terms half theta square uh, d2 g over d theta square evaluated at theta equal to zero and so on. Right? I can make this expansion. Now taking really infinitesimal element means that I just take the linear, the first order term and ignore all the higher order terms because theta is already very very small, right? So theta square is much much smaller, right? So we ignore that. Okay. So the idea is to just take this element. This is the this is the infinitesimal one. Okay. So. Now, in this particular example, we can immediately check. So, at theta equal to zero, this becomes one, 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 zero, zero. Now, if I look at the first order in theta and use the, I mean, just take this derivative, dg, dg by d theta. So, this becomes sine theta minus sine theta. Uh, I mean, this becomes sine theta. This becomes cos theta, cos theta, sine theta to the plus or minus sign. Huh? So, now, now I set theta equal to zero. Okay then all the sine theta which will be here they become zero okay and what is left over is just coming from here because this became cos theta after taking derivative so it becomes minus one one so so this guy uh, this uh, in this example dg by d theta so in this example let us see dg by d theta at theta equal to zero is nothing else but zero minus one one so Right? So this this element, I mean this object, is called the generator of the group. Okay. It's called the generator of the group. Because I mean then once you understand the, how the infinitesimal acts, as I said, you keep repeating many, many times as infinitesimal actions, and then you can get the finite transformations. So this is the thing. Uh, the, the set of infinitesimal generators uh, actually uh, forms a vector space. You see, I mean, at the level of group, there was no concept of addition of the two elements, right? You had a group composition rule, but that was not addition, group composition rule. So, for example, if I look at this group element, if I take the product of these two, uh, g of theta. Uh, times g of uh, theta prime, let's say, this will be given by this matrix multiplication, right? It's not that you are adding up these two uh, matrices. It's a so this is the g theta, this is g theta prime, which are each of them is two by two matrix, and you multiply them, right? So it is not you, you don't have you're not adding that. It's a group composition rule. The group composition rule here is a matrix multiplication, right? But at the level of infinitesimal generators, you can add them. Up. So, for example, if I take, uh, 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 so, so element, let's say, say g of theta and g of theta prime, product of these two, and take again each of them, let's suppose, is close to the identity. Okay, then I can expand this as the identity. So I don't know. Let, let me just call it identity here, plus uh, theta times dg by d theta at theta equal to zero, and so on, and, uh, and other dot, dot, dot terms. And similarly, this guy is identity plus uh, g of theta prime, uh, sorry, uh, uh, theta prime, dg by d, d, g prime, d or by d theta prime, or theta prime equal to zero, etc. Okay. And now I take the product of these two. These are, each of them is a matrix here. Each of them is a matrix, two by two matrix. 
Now I take the product of this matrix multiplication, then you see this becomes identity plus theta plus theta prime, uh, the, sorry, theta dg, dg by d theta plus theta prime dg over d theta prime. Okay. Evaluated it. I mean, this line is a shorthand notation for theta equal to zero. Okay. Uh, this plus higher order terms. Higher order terms can be of two types. It can be theta square, theta prime square, or theta theta prime. But since the, each of them is infinitesimal, the product is like much, much smaller. <laughs> so all of these terms you ignore, and then you look at the first order in these guys, it's just say additive. You're just adding them up. You see? So there's a concept of adding them up. Now. So that, that is nice about it because I mean it's much easier to study the systems when you can just add them up. No? That's the important point. So essentially what we are saying is that if you focus on the infinitesimal parts, this guys, no? then there is a vector space structure. What is the meaning of vector space structure? Vector space, given any two vectors, you can add them up, right? There's a notion of adding them up. Right? No, uh, but uh, for this, you have to have, you know, the matrix representation. Of the group. If you don't have matrix representation, then uh, can you add them? Yeah, you can still add them up. Uh, uh, well, I mean, right. Uh, you can abstractly still add them up. I mean, in fact, if I look at the abstract note, abstract meaning of this, what is this? What, what are we doing here? What we are doing here is that we have some space, okay? Some space, the, which is the space of all these the parameters, alpha i's, okay? Which defines a group. Uh, so the group is, so if it's a compact group, like in, a, in this case, it was just a circle. In this case, I mean, SO2 case, this was simply a circle. Let's, let's focus on SO2, okay? So this is just a circle. The theta going from 0 to 2 pi. Okay. Theta is uh, 0 to 2 pi. So this was a circle. Now what we are doing is that, so this is theta, theta equal to 0. So here is my identity. Now on this on this uh, space, what we are looking at is a, just an infinitesimal part. So infinitesimally close to identity. Right? This is nothing else, but the, if, you, if you geometrically what we are doing is we are drawing a tangent tangents to the groups, the space of the, the group around at that point of, at the, at the identity. Okay. Now the tangent space is always a vector space. Mm -hmm. you see. So this is the, what I'm saying is that this, the infinitesimal generators that we are talking about is nothing else. So infinitesimal generators belong, they belong to the tangent space. Uh, of the Cartesian uh, space of the group at identity. So it means that the generators need not be you know, the elements of the group itself. They are not elements of the group. Okay. Yeah. And we have to assume that uh, the, the group elements are uh, you know, analytic with respect to the parameters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the you're really talking about yeah. There is a continuous. It's a continuous a smooth space, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a way you can, uh, I mean, there's a relation between the uh, generator and the group element. It's in the sense of exponentiation, yeah. you know. So a group element, not arbitrary group element, but at least, say, neighboring uh, the points which are related to the identity, connected to the identity, mm -hmm. those can be expressed as exponential of the generators, infinitesimal generators. So that, uh, uh, do, uh, do all the generators of the groups um, form a group in themselves or not? Do all the generators of a group? Do they form a group? All this? Is that necessary or not? Well, I mean, um, uh, not really. I mean, uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, in, in this case, it's just a vector space action. There's only a vector space action. There is no. Uh, yeah. There is no. It's not a group in general, right? Yeah. It's not. Um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 well, it's a group under addition, basically addition. You know? But it's nothing to do with the original. I mean, it's not the same operation as the original group operation. 
it's just an additive thing, right? You just so you can just add them. Another group under addition, but not the same as the original. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, I, what I want to show, which I think many of you have already seen, um, that uh, every time, that if, you have, if there's a physical system where there is some, which has some symmetry, okay? Um, yeah. Is a zero matrix, uh, can a zero matrix be a generator? Because if they form a group under addition, then it should have an identity. And what would be that identity? It be the zero matrix. Uh, uh, sorry, repeat that again. A, a group of no, a set of matrices. If they form a group under addition, then what is the identity of this group? Is it the generator group? Ah, identity will be zero. Zero. So yeah. Yeah. Can zero matrix be a generator? Um, zero, because I mean, when you say vector space, it means that given a generator, uh, what, I, what do I mean by vector space? You see, this theta can be any number here. Mm -hmm. This is what I call generator. Mm -hmm. Theta could be any number. I mean, of course, when I'm thinking in terms of infinitesimal, but once I have obtained this generator, mm -hmm. then I can multiply this by any number, x, dg by d theta, okay, which again is a generator in the sense that I can, I can take this and put that here, x, inside here, no, that is still, it's a, it's a infinitesimally close to identity. So you're saying that uh, this can have vector space, but every point in that vector space need not be a generator itself. Um, I mean, if you take zero, if you multiply by zero, it's just ident you get arrived at the level of group element, you arrive to the identity itself. Right? Okay. So you would say that the generator span of vector space. Generator span. Every point in the vector space need not be a, uh, a generator itself. Is that true or not? I mean, it depends on what you mean by that. Because uh, you see, uh, uh, I, if I. Uh, Okay, you have to always have a, if, uh, you have to always have a, a infinitesimal parameter here, right? But apart from that, you can multiply this by any number, mm -hmm. right? Any number, any finite number times this infinitesimal parameter is again, right? Is a, is a, is infinitesimal. Well, in fact, I mean, the relation will, there will be a relation which is a generator, let's call it T, T is a generator, in general, I'm just calling, uh, generator and the group itself by some exponential map. This is exponential map which relates T to the group element G. So take an element of the Lie algebra, which is uh, this vector space now. Any element of the vector space, and then you can exponentiate it. Okay. That will go give a point in the, in the so, group. Uh, the zero, zero vector that I'm talking about, if you exponentiate that, then you that will be the identity itself. Yeah. I mean, it, again, I, I repeat that it's not always the case that this exponential map will span the entire. Okay. It will be contained in the group. In the, okay. It will be contained in the group, the full group. Okay. It may not be possible to span. It depends on the situation. Um, right. Uh, so what I want to uh, say now is that, which you are, I think all of you have seen this, but uh, again to repeat it because it's a very important theorem, no third theorem, no. Uh, it's a very important theorem. Uh, so, if there is a system, physical system, uh, which has some kind of some symmetry, right? Uh, some group of symmetry, which is a continuous group. Okay. Then, for every such group element, group generate every such generator, right? I mean, if there is a continuous group, as we saw, there, there will be generators. If there are n parameter n independent parameters here, there will be n independent such terms here, right? More generally, to be, here I just took one parameter, g theta. But if I if I consider it here and again expand it, I will have g of say zero zero zero, this which is identity. I start with identity plus uh, alpha i dg by d alpha i sum over i and set all the alphas equal to zero, all the alphas equal to zero. Right? So now you see that are, these are all independent parameters. So for each index i. I have one generator, right? And then, of course, so this each of these, so there are n generators here, right? And then, so the, the, the space of generators is n-dimensional vector space here, right? Because these are n independent generators. Then, of course, you can start taking linear combinations of them, right? In fact, this itself is a linear combination, right? So it will be n-dimensional in that case. So the number of independent generators is the same 
as a number is a dimension of the group. Right? Because for every parameter there will be a generator. If the dimension is n, there are n parameters, n generators. Right? And therefore the, the, there will be n dimensional vector space. Uh, so the statement is that for every such, every generator, there will be a conserved charge. This is the not of theorem. Okay. So uh, let me just go through that. I mean, you have, I, I think, I'm sure you all know this, but uh, let me just uh, repeat this again. Mm. So what does it mean to have it? So, so let's just take an example. Uh, and this is the example which appears quite commonly in the, cl in the systems, classical systems of particles uh, moving in some space. Okay, so let's consider a, a classical system uh, with the, uh, with the po uh, positions qi and the velocity is qi dot. So I, I goes from one to some number, doesn't matter, huh? some finite number. Okay, uh, so these are the positions and these are the velocities. Dot. I mean, so this is a function of t. So you are thinking of a particle, a point particle moving in some space uh, where the space coordinates are labeled by qi, okay, and qi dots are the, the velocities. So qi dot means d by dt of qi, qi okay. So that's a velocity standard, right? Of course, this may not be just a single particle. This could be, you may have many, many different particles, right? And each of them comes with some, uh, their coordinates. So this is just generically the, configura the configuration space. Huh? Configuration variables, and that's the moment, uh, the velocities. Uh, and then there is a Lagrangian density. Uh, Lagrangian density will be a function of qi and qi dots. That will be the Lagrangian. And uh, you, as you, you know, in classical, you can start from the Lagrangian, you can get the equation of motion and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now let's suppose, let's consider uh, that uh, some uh, transformation, and uh, the transformations are parameterized as some some transformation of the coordinates qi. Uh, so this takes qi to some function of qi. Okay. Right. So, for, I mean, for example, uh, if it were just a translating the qi, this function would be simply qi plus a, a r. Huh? If it is rotation, it will be that rotation, uh, rotation groups, uh, whatever, whatever the symmetry, some transformation. Hmm? And now this transformation, of course, uh, there could be many ind independent ways of transform transformations, right? Uh, there could be many different ways of tra trans uh, transformation, for example, translations, rotations, all these things, right? So in general, these transformations will depend on some parameters. Let me just call it S A. Yeah? I just use the same notation as trying to use here. Okay. So this is a transformation which depends. So this transformation depends on some parameters. Depends on some continuous parameters. On the continuous parameters. S A, which I am labeling by S A. Parameters. Yes, okay. so there could be a set of parameters, right? As an example, I mean, if you just think of translation and rotations, uh, this SA will include the translation parameters and the rotation parameters. Right? And that is what we'll be discussing mostly. So but at the moment, we just abstractly say, okay, so it depends on some parameters. These parameters, of course, don't depend on the cues. They're just, uh, you know, they're just uh, the, the, the group parameters, parameters which uh, define the group. group. So, uh, so this is we consider that. And let's further assume that when I make such a transformation, the Lagrangian doesn't change. Okay. That is the what is what we mean by symmetry, right? When you say a system is symmetric, 
uh, under some uh, transformations, that's what we mean. That if I make this transformation, the Lagrangian remains in the root. Uh, so, okay, so, so what we want is, so the invariant statement means that L of QI, QI dot, is the same as L of F, so I should put here FI, sorry, FI, and this is a, set, this is a, so this is a function of all the Qs, eh? maybe I shouldn't put here the index, because See, QI goes to FI, okay? but this is a function of all the Qs. Mm -hmm. So I will not put here the index because this is actually all. Suppose there are I goes from 1 to N. Okay? Here there are all the N Qs. Okay? And A goes from 1 to something. A goes from 1 to, uh, let's call it D. Okay? That is the dimension of the group. You, you can put the simple Q in a set bracket. Uh, what, what should I do? Sorry? No, put Q in set brackets. Ah, uh, this bracket, this kind of bracket. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. So same thing here also. Okay. This is SA and all the explicitly. But it's understood that right? this is going to be a function of all the Qs in general. For each each i, Qi goes to Fi, but Fi is a function of Qs and some parameters. So uh, so this uh, now I replace Qi by Fi, which is a function of all the Qs and SAs and uh, dot, so what is qi, qi dot goes to what? qi dot will simply go to fi dot, right? fi q s, right? So the, uh, notice that s does not depend on the time, this has some fixed parameters, q depends on time, okay? So here the time is appearing here, so when the derivative is here, you just take the derivative of this, which will be since the T appears only through the Q's, this is the same as D, uh, as uh, DQ, say J by DT times DF by D, uh, partial, partial derivative, DF by DQJ, FI by QJ. Okay. Some lower J, some lower J. Okay. This is simply this. Uh, this happening because the t dependence does not enter here; it only enters there. Right? So by using the chain rule of differentiation, uh, we just get that, which is the same as of course sum over qj dot df i over dq qj j going from one to n. This is the here n. The number of this index i goes from one to n. Okay, this and fi dot f uh, fi dot qs okay. so this is a statement mm. okay. so this is a statement of invariance that Lagrangian is invariant under such a transformation but you can also add uh, then there is a total derivative and so that it vanishes under set time constraint right? sure, sure yeah but here I'm just taking it to be a uh, the simplest case simplest case yeah. okay that's right Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so this. The, okay. So let's let's see that what happens with this here. Um, now this is true in general, right? For any s, right? Because we are saying s is a parameter. For any s, this is a symmetry. Right. So that's that's the group. That's a symmetry group. Uh, SA labels some group, uh, and uh, we are saying this is true. So since this, uh, so let's just take the uh, derivative of this equation with respect to some SA, okay, and uh, uh, and set it to zero. I mean, uh, this equation must be true, right? So, so what happens? I mean, this is true for all S. So I'm, what I'm saying is, let's look at. Uh, uh, maybe I should say this. Uh, we should say this also that we have chosen this parameter in such a way that when all the s's are equal to 0, so fi of q for all the sa equal to 0, so maybe I should write here, for all sa equal to 0, okay, uh, this is nothing else but the qi itself. Okay. So in other words, what I'm saying is that I've set, chosen the uh, parameter in such a way 
that all the SA equal to zero is the identity element of the group. Okay, so identity element doesn't do anything, right? So, so that's so I've just chosen that. So what I do down here is I take this equation uh, and uh, uh, take the derivative with respect to S and set S equal to zero. Okay, that is the so if I take the derivative with respect to S and then set S equal to zero. That is exactly like doing a Taylor expansion uh, and take this a first order term, right? Now, when I take the d by ds of this, this of course left hand side is zero, so I take d by ds and then and then set set d by ds say let's say and then set or s is equal to zero. Left hand side of course there's no s at all here, so that is zero identically. So this is zero. Now here, let's take the derivative. So what I will get? Uh, so first of all, first of all, before setting this to zero, well, I take d by dsa of this l, and then I set s equal to zero. Again, use the chain rules. So this is the same as d fi over ds a dl over d fi, right? Plus d uh, fi dot uh, over dsa d dl over partial derivative of course partial derivative because there are many parameters dl over d fi q dot fi dot qs this is a same rule and then I have to set s equal to 0 Okay. Fine. Now, uh, if you look at this here, when I set uh, when I set s equal to zero here, but s equal to zero, there's nothing else but the qi itself, qi and qi dot. So when I set s equal to zero, this is nothing else but dl over dqi. Okay. Dl where dl where I mean, there's no I've set s equal to zero here. So uh, so this equation I can rewrite. So, uh, so we have zero equal to now the first term you have dfi dfi I can I'm putting on this lower index so let me keep it dfi sa then s equal to zero and uh, dl by dfi is simply dl q uh, q q q dot okay this is a collection of all of them right all the indices over dqi that's the first term. And the second term is dfi dot over DS, uh, dsa, uh, which is the same as um, d. So let me, let me keep it as dfi dot over dsa, and then set s equal to zero. And then here again for the same reason, if I set s equal to zero, this is simply qi dot, right? I mean, fi dot simply becomes qi dot. So that is uh, dl over d uh, qi dot. That's the uh, equation we find. Now, what is this? This is nothing else but d by dt of of fi uh, of d d dfi over DSA, right? Uh, sorry, uh, DSA by D F J F I D T. Okay. I mean, there's nothing here. F I dot is that. that. That's what it is. Okay. Now we can just use the equations of motion. What is the equation of motion for the Lagrangian? The equation of motion is simply this quantity equal to that quantity, right? Uh, no, not d by dt of that. So this quantity dl by dqi dot qi uh, equal to d by dt of dl by dqi dot. This is the equation of motion which comes from the, from the Lagrangian. That Lagrangian we wrote, this is the general equation of motion. Fine. Okay. 
So I can substitute that here. Then you see what we get. The first term is dFi over dSa is equal to 0 d by dt of dL over dQi dot. And the second term is d by dt of dFi over dSc evaluated at s equal to 0 times dL by dQi dot. And now you see this becomes a total derivative. This becomes d by dt of df by dsi, dfi over dsa, evaluated at s equal to 0 times dl by dqi dot. Okay, uh, so when it, uh, if the derivative hits here, you get that term, and when the derivative hits here, you get that term. Okay. So it's, uh, so, and this is supposed to be, this is equal to 0, the left hand side is 0, right? We are just simplifying the right hand side. Right? So we, we conclude that this is in fact equal to zero. So this quantity remains unchanged. So this is a conserved charge. Okay. It's something which is conserved in your system. So you have used the equations of motion. Okay. So what means that under the equations of motion, the, under the evolution, under the time evolution, equation of motion was, is what gives you the time evolution of the system. Right? The, under the time evolution of that system, uh, this one doesn't change. So if you use the equations of motion, this quantity remains unchanged. In fact. Okay. So this this is a, this is a charge, a conserved charge. And how many conserved charges are there? It's good. It is for each index a. You see here, um, by the way, I, I, somewhere I forgot to mention to you that whenever there is a repeat a repeated index, I'm summing over. Huh? I kind of implicitly assume this because everywhere here there is a sum. You see, at every place here there is a sum over i. Right? This summed over i, that's a summed over i. So everywhere there is a sum over i. Eh? Right? Because this is a, when you do the partial derivative chain by chain rule, you, you have the sum over i. I think in the beginning I kept track of it, but later on I forgot to put the sum. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I should say that uh, from now on, whenever I have a repeated index, huh, it means the sum is understood. Okay. If sum is, if I use a repeated index and I, I do not mean a sum, then I will explicitly say so. Okay. But if I don't say anything, that means it's a repeated. It's a sum. Whenever I see a pair of indices, repeated index, it means a sum. Okay, so what we are saying is that there are, for e, but on the other hand, A is a free, A is free index, you see, okay, so this is true for every A, and so that for every A, there is a charge, conserved charge, which is simply that, df i over ds A, evaluated as equal to 0, times dl over dqi dot, qi dot. Sum over i. Okay. This is a conserved charge. So there are as many conserved charge as the dimension of the group, because a as s a were the parameters of the group, right? For independent parameters of the group, so there's an independent parameter for it, for each index a, right? So that's uh, so there are conserved charges. And this you have seen, of course, right? But uh, here, what I wanted to say is that you see these were exactly. The, the infinitesimal transformations, right? So what we are saying, the infinitesimal transformations, because we are setting s equal to 0, right? Okay, so this is the first order expansion of the fi. I mean, fi of qs, qs, is, uh, for, so, uh, suppose you do a Taylor expansion around s equal to 0, what I will get? Uh, first of all, you set s equal to 0, but s equal to 0, it just gives you qi, because we, we chose the s equal to 0 as the identity element. Hmm? So that's the first element. And then the, then the first term would be s a uh, times d f i over d s a. Okay, I put everything lower index, sum over a. 
plus a higher order principle plus order s square. Hmm? And this is exactly the infinitesimal uh, transformations. Okay. So the statement is that for every inf independent infinitesimal transformation, you get a conservative charge. Okay. So that, that's why, I mean, studying the, the, the infinitesimal transformations are directly linked to the some conserved uh, thing in your physical system, if that group is appearing in a physics problem, no? as a symmetry group. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so let's just take some examples, and then, okay. For example, let's consider a simple system, a two-dimensional system, two two-dimensional uh, system. of a, a free, free particle. Okay, very simple system. So the uh, Lagrangian is nothing else but uh, uh, x dot square plus y dot square. I have two coordinates, x and y. So I'm labeling these two dimensions as coordinates x and y. x dot square plus y dot square uh, times mass over two. Right, that's a standard. Uh, Free particle, I mean, there's no potential, nothing. Just, uh, free particle. Of course, you could add also potential, uh, but uh, let's consider first the free particle. Now, this free particle has, of course, more symmetry. If you add the potential, there won't be so much symmetry. But uh, uh, if I take the free particle, then there's the symmetry here. I can take, I can translate xy to x plus a, y plus b. Translate. Nothing happens because these are not. Uh, this is a fixed parameter. They're not time dependent, right? Time appears only there. These are like the parameters S's, SAs, that I mentioned, right? Uh, that is one possible uh, symmetry. Actually, this has more symmetry because also a rotational symmetry. You see, you could also rotate x y by cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta xy this will be also a symmetry right again theta is a parameter it does not depend on t so if you plug that in here that will be a symmetry um, uh, well you see if I had added the potential energy uh, for example uh, potential energy which depends on some x and y uh, uh, non trivially then you see this symmetry will not be there anymore Okay. However, this could still be there, for example, if the potential energy was like harmonic oscillator <coughs> form, okay. some harmonic oscillator type potential, then this would be still there. Right? So the full symmetry group depends on the details of the potential energy. In fact, for a generic potential energy, there will be nothing, no symmetry left over for a generic one. right? But for some special, very special potentials, you may have some symmetry left over. You, know, you mean the potential will depend only on the, you know, the uh, length of the position you have to or the only the uh, length of the position vector, then the rotational symmetry will be there. But in general, you may not even have that. Maybe some asymmetry, you know, uh, some, uh, there could be some harmonic oscillator which has uh, different tensions uh, in the two directions. Yeah. Then in general, everything will be, yeah. But let's consider the simplest ca case because there the symmetry group is bigger. Mm -hmm. you know? And then ask the question: What happens? Uh, what are the uh, when we, we derive this uh, conserved charges? So let's see what we, we get here. Um, now, if I look at this part here, um, so uh, so it's clear, right? I mean, x uh, the, the coordinates there were q i's. So q one is x and q two is y. That's what I'm saying, right? So if I make the transformation with respect to a, x is shifting by x plus a and nothing ha else happens, y doesn't change, right? Uh, and then, uh, so if I make this transformation, so I will get here, so let's say q of uh, q a, I put here q a, so I will have a q a, q b, this just to indicate, because we said for every generator, for, for every parameter, I have a conserved charge, right? So I have the parameters here, a, b, and theta. So I call here q a, q b, and q theta, three, three quantities I can compute. So, for the QA, only X is changing. So, this guy is simply, uh, uh, I is just X here, 
So you get here QS equal to DL over DX dot. Right? QB is DL over D1 dot. Correct? Because only Y is changing. So in this sum, uh, I mean, sorry, I should have put here x1, x2, it would have been easier, right? <laughs> Maybe I should put here x1 square, x2 square, because then we can directly compare it with the, with the x1, x1 plus, say, a1, uh, a1 uh, x2 plus a2, and here is x1, x2, x1, x2. These are the transformations. So Q, Q, Q1, Q2, and Q theta, right? So Q1 uh, uh, is simply, uh, you're just taking derivative with respect to A1, uh, but under A1, X2 doesn't change, only X1 changes. So in this sum, this sum I is going from one to two, but only one appears there, right? Not the two, because there's no A1 here. X2 doesn't change, right? Uh, so uh, only one survives here, and this is this one here because the, the co this, this linear transformation, right? So this this guy just gives me one, and that gives me dl over dx one dot, and the q two will be dx two dot. But what is this? I mean, if you just compute that, it is m x one dot. That's the momentum along the first direction. So this is the momentum along the first direction, right? And here is m x two dot, which is the momentum along the second direction. Now let's look at the theta. So to write this here, I mean, we can see that what, what it says. Uh, so x1, I mean x1 goes to, sorry, x1, x1 goes to, if I multiply this, so it's cos theta x1 minus uh, sine theta x2, and x2 goes to sine theta x1 plus cos theta x2. So infinitesimally, infinitesimally, x1 goes to Remember, cos theta is expansion 1 plus theta squared by 2, and so on. Yeah? Whereas sine theta is expansion theta minus theta cube or factorial 3, 6, and so on. Right? We are looking at the first order so in thetas. So first order theta, this simply goes to x1, because just take the 1 term. And here you get minus theta x2. And x2 goes to theta x1 plus x2. To the first order, because that's what we are interested in, to first order in theta. Right? Because after taking the derivative, I set it to zero, the parameters are zero. Right? So only first order is important for us. Okay, so I take the derivative. So let's see. So we, we are now computing q of theta, uh, q of this parameter theta. Uh, so, uh, first, so this time you see both the coordinates are transforming. So this sum will include both 1 and 2. Okay. So when I take the uh, d of dx1 over uh, the transform x1, dx1 over d theta, I get minus x2. Okay. So you get here minus x2 times, uh, times uh, dl over x1 dot, which is nothing else but p1. We already computed that p1, right? And this, then when I look at the i equal to 2, I will get here uh, dx2 over d theta, but dx2 over d theta is x1. So you get here plus x1 and then p2. This is nothing else but the angular momentum, right? Angular momentum of this uh, two-dimensional system. Uh, so this, uh, so that's uh, again comes up. So you see that uh, the trans every time there's a translational symmetry that corresponds to momentum conservation, and every time there is a rotational symmetry that corresponds to angular momentum conservation. But if these symmetries were not there, if your system did not have these symmetries, these quantities will not be conserved in general. Huh? So in physics, the conservation laws and symmetries are very, uh, 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 continuous symmetries are very intimately related. Okay. For example, the conservation of energy is related to the fact that there is a time translation invariance. Okay. So, so that's uh, right. And in particular, it's not just that. You see, to, uh, what this is also emphasizing is, is that the infinitesimal gen generators already capture the conservation loss. 
you don't need to know the full group. It is infinitesimal generators already tell you. Okay. Uh, any questions on this? Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes we have systems that are invariant under maybe parity transformation, and we then have a, a concept of quantity which is the parity. But well, this is a discrete function. This is a discrete. So function. it doesn't follow from like this. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't follow because there's no there's no generator, infinite is no generator. It's a, just a discrete thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have of course parity invariant theory. Uh, it's a reflection, right? You take a uh, say one just one coordinate goes to minus x goes to minus x. So under this case, these are discrete uh, symmetries, and uh, it, it just says like a discrete quantum number. Right? I mean, this is continuous. Momenta are continuous way. I mean, can take any value of momentum, right? Whereas in other cases, you have only parity e1, parity odd, you know. Uh, it's uh, a Monsaur theorem that we, uh, we just uh, do an example of it. So uh, it follows from the fact that we use uh, the equation of motion. What if uh, there is a case where we call it uh, off shell? So the system does not uh, follow the equation of motion. So can we say that uh, the synergy is breaking? Yeah, you will, I mean, uh, yeah, indeed, in quantum mechanics, you will go, you have to go off shell, you're not always on shell. Uh, but these have consequences also that. You also get some conserved currents there. Okay. Uh, but it's a bit more subtle. I mean... Uh, using Noether's theorem or other... Uh, you can start from Noether's theorem, but uh, you will get uh, these things as some kind of... Uh, um, in the correlation functions, or, or you know, you, you'll find that they, they again play a role. I mean, you'll see particularly in the next semester. Uh, not this semester, also already you will see quantum field theory course, uh, but uh, particularly in the next, sem next semester, uh, you will see uh, what, what is called the path integral formulation of the, of, of the quantum field theory, or you know, quantum mechanical systems. In path integral, uh, these things are very, uh, I mean you can, because in path integral you start with basically action, classical action, and do some path in the functional integral. Yeah? Uh, and um, so, it will turn out that this will give certain relations uh, for various amplitudes. It will sort of tell you that one particular amplitude is related to another particular amplitude. You know, we used to be saying that uh, this quantity is conserved if the, you know, the system is following the classical trajectory. Right. And that's why we are imposing the equation of motion to the system follows the classical that's trajectory. Right. Yeah. But what, I, mean, I think, it, coming to your question, it has consequences also in quantum theory. Mm -hmm. right. You will study that in, the, in detail, I think. Both, uh, both in this semester and next semester. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it happens, and this is a very, very important thing. That sometimes it happens. Um, I mean, this will uh, still imply the conservation laws. Actually, in quantum, in quantum theory, in, in scattering matrices, scattering. If you take scattering of particles, uh, initial momentum is the same as final momentum. Energy is conserved. That also follows in quantum theory. Um, but sometimes it happens uh, that some classical symmetries uh, uh, do not go over to the quantum theory. Anomalies. These are anomalies. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some, some theories which have anomalies. In which case, uh, anomaly is precisely the statement that you have classical symmetry, but at quantum level it's broken. Okay. But not, this doesn't happen for these kinds of quantities. Uh, energy, momentum, angular momentum, these things are conserved. But some other symmetries, which are like chiral symmetries, uh, which we will study later, uh, there are anomalies. And, um, and they have very important physical consequences also, which you will see. I mean, uh, it's really crucial that those anomalies were there, otherwise there would be problems with the, <laughs> with the theory. I mean, theory will not agree with that ex uh, observation. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean, you were studying detail, but since you asked this question, let me just uh, just say why, why, what this, I mean, why that can happen. I mean, you'll study in the next semester. Uh, you see, you are familiar with, uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, you know, you, you have the, the classical theory of a Poisson bracket. When you go to quantum theory, Poisson bracket is replaced by the commutator, right? That is what you usually do. This is what is called canonical quantization. But there is another way of formulating this uh, quantum theory. These are through this Feynman uh, developed this method. It is called path integral formulation. Okay, and essentially the idea is, I mean, this uh, sorry, this is a side remark. I mean, don't don't 
you will uh, you will study it uh, in detail later. But essentially, the idea is you have a classical system, you have a classical action, right? Uh, classical action will depend on whatever your variables are. Hmm? Okay. So in, in field theory, it will depend on some fields, let's say scalar field or whatever, and the, uh, the derivatives of the scalar fields, etc. Okay. It will depend on all these things. So, yeah. uh, so uh, this depends on something. Now, uh, or in quantum, in uh, particle, in just in quantum mechanics, it will depend on Q and Q dots, right? Q i and Q i dots, like what we did here. Now, uh, Feynman developed this beautiful method, which has because it, it, it tells you very uh, how uh, quantum system is very close to the classical system, I mean, but still it is different. No? So somehow you stay always close to the classical, but you study studying quantum theory. Right? Uh, and the, the way is the, what is called the path integrals. So path integral you define, uh, let's just call it some z, uh, z, uh, which is basically defined as uh, the integrals of, and I will mean, use some script dqi, okay, uh, all for all i's. I uh, just take one, one, one coordinate, just suppose one, uh, a particle moving in one dimension. So that I don't have to worry about the i index. So you have dq. Uh, uh, dq. So q. Uh, if I take any trajectory, here is my time, uh, time, time, and q, right? So I start with some initial, initial time. So t initial, and it has some value, q i, initial i. This index i is not sorry. This is only one q, but this just means initial value of q, uh, and uh, the final value of q. Let's say this Tf, Tf is a, and here is Qf. Okay. So uh, let's suppose I have fixed initial position and the final position, and at, at the given time Ti and Tf. Then you see you can have all possible trajectories, right? I mean the Q could be going like that, and like that, or some some complicated shapes. How, how can you go back in time? No, not in back in time. Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean cl uh, classically. Uh, okay, but. Uh, uh, I just want to ask the question, how do I reach from here to there? Uh, there are all sorts of ways. I mean, wiggly ways and all sorts of ways, right? It, it can reach there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, but of these, classical trajectory will be one of them, right? For example, if I have a free particle, if I tell you initial uh, and final thing, then there will be just a straight line trajectory mm -hmm. in this QT plot, no? Uh, so, classical trajectory will be some something, some definite trajectory. Now, what you do here is that you basically write uh, you integral, uh, the integrand here is the action with the imaginary side thing divided by h bar, where s is the, this action. And this, it, by this integral, what I mean is I integrate over all possible paths, all possible paths. Okay? And there is a, uh, uh, this script D is just that there is a measure. When you, when you define the integral, you have to define a measure. So there is an appropriate measure. You, so this is an infinite dimensional integral because there are infinite num number of trajectories, infinite, infinite uh, parameter family of trajectories. No, it is an infinite dimensional integral. Roughly speaking, you can think of this as I mean, if I divide this time interval into some slices, no, uh, with some uh, spacing epsilon, then I can think of this as a product. Uh, over all the uh, t, uh, or, or let's say, I don't know, this is a 1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, q, uh, dq at t, uh, what should I call it? ti plus uh, initial time plus uh, n times epsilon. Right? Uh, uh, n is going from 1 to whatever, the final number is, say, capital N. So, the way I take this time interval, split it into capital N. Uh, uh, spacings. Huh? Then, if uh, I mean this, into this uh, summing over all possible paths, I can think of it as specifying the ti and tf is fixed, right? This, but in, in between, the value of q here can be anything, right? The value of q here can be anything. Right? So you have the integral over that, but then you take the limit, epsilon goes to zero. But if you take the limit, epsilon goes to zero, this n becomes infinity. Okay. So it's, a, it's an infinite dimensional integral, okay. but you can make some sense of it. But the important point here is that you are very close to the classical 
system because you have classical action here. So whatever classical symmetries you have, uh, you can uh, you can use this uh, transformations and show that uh, that it has some consequences. I mean, what kind of consequences you get? Yeah? So you can trace this uh, Noether theorem here okay. and see what is the effect of that. Uh, you like equations. Yeah, 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 correct, correct. And and more uh, importantly, uh, I mean, also another thing to, that follows from here is that if h bar goes to zero limit, I mean, you should somehow get the classical trajectory, right? And indeed, that's what happens because if h bar is very, very small, so what's the classical? Uh, classical solution is something which extremizes the action, right? So, so S evaluated with the Q class Q classical is something which is either the it's a is a stationary point. No? So if I look at S uh, of Q, uh, Q, which is Q classical plus some small variation delta Q, so some small uh, you take take the classical trajectory. Suppose the classical trajectory was this. Okay. Now I consider a small fluctuation from that, very tiny fluctuation from that, away from the classical trajectory. Okay. And uh, that's what I'm calling delta Q. Delta Q is a function of T. You know, is a full function. Then the important point about the uh, classical thing is that this is uh, Q classical plus something of the order delta Q square, because the linear term in delta Q is vanishing. Because that's ex linear term is exactly the equations of motion, right? Uh, extremizing the, so that if this thing satisfies, you get delta Q square, and, uh, and then you see that uh, this delta Q square. If I substitute that here, then uh, if h bar is very tiny, this is going to be infinitely oscillating, right? In infinitely os oscillating very rapidly, so that they will all cancel out. So, in the limit h bar goes to zero, we somehow go back to the classical system. This trajectory, that in this infinite dimension integral, the thing which dominates is the classical trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the path which dominates is a classical trajectory. So, uh, this is a very nice formulation. But uh, what is uh, important for, from, from this discussion is that I, I now I can use all this Noether theorem here. You know, and that will give us the relations between various correlation functions. Different, it will relate one correlation function to another correlation function, and so on. Okay. And at the end, it also you know gives gives the uh, the conservation loss in the if you take the scatterings of some particles to go into some other particles, the charge is conserved, momentum is conserved, energy is conserved, all of that follows. Angular momentum is conserved, all that is follows. Now, the problem with this anomaly comes because you have this infinite dimension integral. And you define it properly, no? And it turns out that sometimes it is not, even though a classical action may have some symmetry, but somehow this uh, this measure is such that it measure is not symmetric under that transformation, and that is where the quantum anomalies appear in quantum theory. Okay, uh, but that that happens for uh, that happens usually for the fermionic symmetries and chiral symmetries. And it won't. Uh, it's okay. All right. Now I'm almost finished with the time. So I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. Just one more concept I can mention uh, because I wanted to do also the next chapter, SU two, SU three, but that I will do tomorrow because then uh, what I just do discuss is here is that. Um, um, but, but, but before erasing this, any question? Any question on this? Uh, um, you know, um, we can say that a real number is like an indexing set for the group. Uh, sorry, repeat that. Real numbers, huh? No, a real number is like uh, a parameter set for the you know the group elements. Yeah. So can we use any other set other than real numbers for you know parameterizing the group elements? You can choose complex numbers, yeah. No, uh, other, uh, other than complex and real numbers. Um, well, which is continuous and ordered, so we can. Uh, Con know. Continuous then? You know, it, but it has to be continuous. So yeah, yeah. I mean, here we are really talking about them. These are continuous groups, so there has to be. And the set um, has to be ordered or not? I mean, uh, so in these things, we are just talking about the real numbers or complex numbers. 
But is there any other uh, set uh, which we can use to parameterize the, real, uh, the group elements of a real e group? As far as I know, it is not. I, mean, I think uh, that would be something totally different, I think. But yeah, for the, this, uh, if I want the algebras and the groups, we are always talking about real or complex numbers. So, uh, does there have to be a um, bijective mapping from real numbers to that set? Is that necessary? Uh, meaning what? So some uh, some uh, real numbers are not allowed. So there are okay. gaps and so on. In one to one correspondence with real numbers. Is that, is it, is that a necessity or not? Yeah, I think because otherwise this, all this vector space structure will not be there, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, sum of any two numbers is again a number. No? Mm -hmm. So, basically, that will, yeah. I, I think, yeah, here we are just talking about the ordinary numbers, ordinary real numbers or complex numbers, right? Um, yeah, complex number, uh, yeah. Uh, although, for, I mean, com in physics, usually we'll be talking about uh, uh, the, the kinds of groups that appear are uh, kind of. Uh, not the most general groups. I mean, you can have, you know, groups where the general. In physics, what happens is that all these generators that you get, right, uh, of the continuous groups, they can be represented in terms of Hermitian, mm -hmm. Hermitian operators. Okay. okay. Um, that's because in physics and quantum mechanics and so on, the evolution is always unitary. Everything is unitary. There's, there's a norm in the in the Hilbert space. Right? Which is invariant under unitary transformations. Uh, uh, but suppose that there is a set which we can use to parameterize the uh, group uh, elements, then uh, does that set has to be altered because without ordering, how will you define differentiation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have never, never seen any, any discussion about the group based on something else, yeah. apart from real number or complex numbers. Okay. I've seen it. Um, and that's why I, said it's I don't know if uh, one can use quaternions for something, uh, but even quaternion can be rewritten in terms of uh, SU2 matrices and so on. So, yeah. Um, there, there's. Uh, yeah, uh, any, anything else? Uh, the, you had another, uh, in that same question, you had a second question also, or not? Just that question you had. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, let me just mention, because I mentioned at one point when, when we were discussing uh, when we were discussing this uh, two-dimensional translational group, uh, so we had x goes x y going to x plus a y plus b. So uh, I mentioned some uh, that this is the same as r times r. Okay, where r must be the uh, one real line which is group under addition, right? So a think of a a is a real line, real number with the you know, which is a group under addition, addition compositions addition. Same thing with the B, so these are two independent you know, this R times R. Now this, uh, so in general I can define uh, products between say group G1 and G2. This is called the direct product. I mean, actually there is also something more general than this, but for the moment let me just define the direct product. The direct product, uh, so when you have a product like this, yeah, what are the elements? First of all, I will define what are the elements. The elements of this, the most general elements of this can be written as a pair of elements. G1 belonging to, this belongs to capital G1 and this belongs to capital G2. Maybe I should use even different uh, something. Yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe I should use even different thing. So G and let me call it uh, G times H, to, uh, not just the index. So you have a G and a H, where H belongs to capital H. So it's a pair, it's a pair of elements, one from here, one from there. That's okay, that's uh, fine as far as the set is concerned. So what is the product? This is a product of two sets, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but now I need to define the composition rule. If you say it's a group, I need to define a composition rule. So I want to specify what is, if I take G, H, belonging to this, uh, belonging to this product group, and I want to take the composition of this with G prime for my H prime, 
where G prime is an element of G, another element of G, H prime is another element of H. Hmm? So this composition rule is defined in the following way. So this again is going to be inside this set, so it will be a, of the form an element of capital G and an element of capital H. So which capital, which element of capital G? It is simply G times O uh, composition, but here this composition rule is a composition rule here. Okay? So whatever this composition rule is, let me put here capital G. So it's a, it's a rule in capital G. And here I have H, H prime, where here the rule is capital H rule. Okay? So this is what, uh, this is the, this is what's called direct product rule. Okay? Uh, so from this, uh, you can see immediately that uh, it was it was okay to say R times R direct product R because the composition rules of each of them is addition and they are totally independent. I mean, you know, they, they independently they act. Uh, there are uh, more, uh, uh, there's a slight, slight, I mean, there's a generalization of that which is called semi-direct product, okay, uh, which maybe you have already seen in the, in the, in the relativistic quantum mechanics, yeah, relativity, or you're not seeing that, or even you don't even need to go to relativity. You can just talk about the, the Euclidean group, you know, uh, including rotation and the translation. So, if you take the product of a rotation group with a translation group, it is not a direct product. Okay, uh, it's what is called semi-direct product, and the re reason is easy to see. I mean, imagine I do a translation first. Okay and then a rotation. So I start with some point, <coughs> I do a translation, I go to another point, and then I do a rotation. Okay, This is going to go somewhere. But instead of that, first I rotate, and then do the translation, you won't get the same vector. right? So you have to take into account that uh, thing. So that is what is semi-direct product. You, you can say that for a direct product, the generator of the two groups is commute. Okay, exactly, yeah. exactly, precisely. Yeah, this because the product rules are totally, uh, they don't see each other at all. Right? So, yeah. Exactly. So, because I mean, if I now look at the, um, look at the, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I, I have not defined the commutator yet. Uh, so, I <laughs> next time I will define the commutator. Uh, yeah, the Lee algebra, yeah. yeah. I have not defined yet, so I, next time we will do this. Yeah. In the relativistic case, huh? in the relativistic case, what would be the semi-direct product? Something like a yeah. Lorentz boost plus a rotation or uh, not Lorentz boost the rotation? That that is a big. That's one big group. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a but uh, it's a translation again. Translation. Oh, okay. Yeah. So point correct. Yeah. Uh, Lorentz group is fine, but when you go to the point correct group, which includes the translation, then, then again the semi-direct product. Ah, okay. Semi-direct product of the uh, Lorentz group with the translation group. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So, if uh, there are no more questions, I will uh, stop now. Yeah. Uh, we talked about uh, this group is compact. We are talking about its topology. Yeah. Topology that's right. Is there any way that we can make a non-compact group into compact? Um, I mean, the non-compact groups mm -hmm. can have compact subgroups. That is true. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens. That happens generically. That happens. But uh, how will you make it uh, non-compact? Uh, I mean, in some sense, I don't know. Uh, many times you can just do it by um, uh, putting a, a kind of analytic continuation. Many times mm -hmm. you can do that. Uh, so. Yeah, but it makes a big difference I mean, in terms of physics is totally different in two cases. Well, for example, we'll start, see that uh, SU2 and SL2 are, uh, SU2 group, I mean, we have not talked about it, Tomor tomorrow I'll talk about SU2, but uh, then there is an SU2 group which is a special unitary 2 by 2 matrices, group of that, this matrices, and SL2 R is a very simple group, it's a, it's a 2 by 2 real matrices with determinant equal to 1, simply that. Because that's preserved under multiplication. Determinant equal to 1 is preserved under matrix multiplication. So this is a consistent condition. You can no? And these two groups are, both are three-dimensional. And in some sense, you can think of them, as one of them is like uh, complexifying some parameter of SU2. 
But the physics is totally different. Isn't it? In, in fact, the way we will study the, the uh, not in the beginning, but when we start discussing the higher LDL, SU3, SU4, uh, uh, generally algebras, the what we will do is actually. Uh, so we go to this Lie algebra first of all, because in fact, as I said, most of the course will be entirely on Lie algebra. Hmm? Uh, apart from the first few lectures, it will be all focused on Lie algebras. But then Lie algebras. Uh, so uh, let's say these generators that we talked about here, the translation generator, rotation generator, etc., you are allowed to multiply by real numbers, right? Um, but you, what you can do formally is to complexify. You know, you say that, okay, I'm, I'm going to multiply by complex numbers. Hmm? Okay, so this is what's called complexification. So it, it's, if I start with the three dimensional Lie algebra, which was uh, where you have three real numbers multiplying them, uh, three dimensional vector space with the real numbers multiplication. Uh, then you allow complex numbers, so it becomes six dimensional, uh, six real dimension. And uh, what happens is that you can study a lot of properties by going to the complexification. And then, so let's take the example of SU2. So SU2, as I said, uh, by, uh, so you can go to the complex, so it becomes three complex parameters. SL2 is also three complex parameters. It turns out that once you start with these three complex parameters, and choose some re reality condition to truncate it to three real dimension. There are different ways of choosing this reality condition. One way you get SU2, other way you get SL2, and so on. So, you know, so that, but the, the physics becomes very different. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly for, I mean, our case, because in many cases, in, 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 we need unitary representations. You know, for physics, we need unitary. Our generator should be Hermitian. You know, that thing doesn't happen for SL2 and so on, for other groups. So, I mean, I'll be entirely focusing on these uh, situations where uh, generators are, can be realized in Hermitian, you know, Hermitian you know, and unitary representations. Because that's what you appear in physics. Our type of physics, you know. Okay. Ah, I have to close here. Yeah, this is, I always forget.